What's up, everyone? My name is Andy Galpin, uh, and I'm really honored to talk to you today. Jay, thank you for the invitation here. I'm really excited to talk about this. I love coaching. I love training. I'm an SNC guy, so uh, it always feels good for me to, to talk to coaches. Uh, if you've never heard of me, most of you probably have not. I work at Cal State Fullerton, so I'm technically a scientist. Uh, I'm part-time faculty. I run the Center for Sport Performance there where we study sport performance. We're one of the few in the country that actually does that. And uh, I, on the side, I sort of teach classes in strength and conditioning program design. We actually offer uh, an undergraduate concentration in strength and conditioning as well as a master's degree that, that focuses in strength and conditioning. So I'm part-time scientist, part-time teacher, and then on the side, I actually work with athletes. I don't do what most of you do out there. I don't have 100 athletes coming through my gym or on the floor every single day. Um, I work pretty much one-on-one -on -one concierge with uh, mostly remote or in-person athletes, uh, but usually high-level folks. So UFC fighters, uh, world champion boxers, uh, a lot of combat sport athletes, um, kind of on a very one-on-one -on -one basis. I've done the big thing before in the past, but for the most part I do there. So I can't claim to know some of the things and I'm probably have the least expertise of anybody that's going to be giving any of these talks uh, on that type of stuff. So I don't want you to think that I'm a full-time SSC coach or anything like that. But uh, I can offer some insights into a few things. And when Jay approached me about this, you know, again, I was first just honored. And I said, Jay, I don't think I can help you, man. I don't know. I'm not a strength conditioning coach. And I don't research hypertrophy. I don't, I can't give you exact reps and sets. And and he swore that that would be okay, so if this is an epic fail, um, demand your money back, send him a hate email, I'll give you his email address at the end. Um, but we talked about a couple of different things, and he sold me on it, and uh, I honestly, Jay, I can't remember what we even talked about. And so when I went to make this video, I thought, shit, I don't know what to even talk about here, so I'm just going to talk about training technology. And so that's what I want to do today, is talk about so how some of the science behind what we can how we can use some of these training technologies uh, and how we can not be used by them. So major conflict of interest, I have a book out on the topic. But really, to be honest with you, and don't uh, don't go telling my publisher this, but you don't even need to buy the damn book. I'm going to give you all the gold here, um, all the gold that you care about. So what I've kind of done is taken all the stuff that maybe a strength conditioning coach would actually care about and put that into this talk today. So there's other stuff in the book that we're not going to cover, um, but... This is really the goal, so this is basically that book. So as most of you, I'm sure, are quite aware, the fitness technology industry is projected to grow to about $30 billion annually um, by 2020. Now the crazy part about this is this figure is basically generated on only fitness trackers, uh, watches, and, and things like that. It doesn't count GPSs, which is you know, probably double or triple or 10x this number alone. I'm not even sure. Uh, it doesn't count things like wearable EMG software like Athos, a company that I've worked with for a while. It doesn't count things like silver-based uh, nanotechnologies or HRV or any of the things that you are probably using. I doubt many of you are using Apple Watches to track your athletes. I mean, some of you might. It doesn't even count heart rate monitors or basic things like that. It doesn't count the advanced neurohacker, biohacker summit stuff where you're putting sunglasses on your face and they're shooting beams into your eyeball and they're training your brain waves and gamma and alpha waves and things like that or the headphones that can send signals to your brain to uh, alter motor learning control or any nootropic uh, technology like that and then it sure as hell doesn't count things like Neuralink which is Elon Musk's company where he is literally trying to connect your brain directly to the internet. And so this problem is not going away anytime soon and I don't want to just you to bury your head in the sand. I also don't want you to spend your entire in career reinventing what you spent 20 years or 10 years getting good at, which is coaching people, trying to just be a technologist. And so hopefully this talk will help you put that stuff together. And so it's not an anti-tech talk per se. What it is is anti-failing. And so you're, you're going to have to manage this one way or the other. There's just no way you, get, you can get around it. Um, we see this in every team now. A lot of your ADs and your parents, the parents of your programs or the donors are probably putting pressure on you to figure this stuff out. And, and it's a full-time job. It'd be more than a full-time job for you to do that. And so what I don't want to talk about is a bunch of individual pieces of technology, though we'll certainly cover several as examples. What I want to talk about is the bigger picture. All right, so how do these things generally fail and how do they generally succeed? And if you know that, 
you can then use them appropriately. 